Welcome, and thank you for attending this week's live Thursdays at Noon community event. For the month of November, we've taken a look at the labor crisis from many angles. Why are businesses, municipalities, hospitals, and organizations unable to find staff? Today, we look at, dis at solutions. But first, and most importantly, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples in the Williams and Huron Robinson Treaties area. We recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis people on this land and show respect to them today. We acknowledge our neighbors, the Wata Mohawks, and the First Nations of Moose Deer Point, Shawanaga, Wasoxing, Magnetowan, and Vienlet, Nipissing, and Dokis. We called our investigation into the labor crisis, labor pains. It has been painful for people, both employers and people looking for work. Our efforts were a 360 degree investigation that looked at the situation from all sides. Now we wanna take what we learned and provide some solutions for both job seekers and employers. This week, we take the question of solutions to the same experts we spoke with at the beginning of our deep dive into the problem. We talk again with Wade Matthews, the Muskoka Employment Partnership Project Coordinator for the District of Muskoka. Lisa Cook, Team Leader of Employment Services at YMCA Simcoe Muskoka in Perry Sound. And Luke Preston, Site Coordinator for the Sundridge Office of Employment North. Welcome panel members once again into the fray. We will begin with Lisa Cook. Lisa, what are the solutions? Well, of course, um, and thank you for having us once again, Pamela. Uh, it's great to be uh, coming back around to this again. Um, you know, I, it, there's been a lot of discussion with employers over the last two years, but as we had talked about the last time we gathered, this issue started before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has really just highlighted a few issues, but it's also, I think, created some opportunities for employers to start to turn things and look at them from another angle. So I'll just sort of go through the list of things that employers can be doing and some potential solutions. Uh, the first one, of course, is flexibility. We talked about that in the first article that came out uh, at the beginning of, of uh, November. So employers who are able to provide more flexible options are gonna find that they will have uh, better staying power with their employees. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, work from home arrangements or flex flexible hours or offering, for example, maybe loo time um, at times that are convenient for their staff, anything like that is gonna go a long way. Training is a big one. Um, this is something that some employers are nervous about providing training for employers because they get worried that they might lose people. But the reality is, you know, that they'll train up and then they'll move on. I'm, I'm trained up. Thank you. I have my ticket. I'm going to move on into a different job. But you'll actually often get more loyalty by investing in the people that you have. And you're also going to have uh, far more competency with those individuals. Uh, Luke and I can speak extensively to Canada Ontario Job Grant, which is available for employers. It's a fantastic program where employers can receive substantial funding towards uh, being able to have higher end training for their employees. Um, we've been seeing this being taken advantage of quite a bit over the last couple of years at my site in Perry Sounds, such as DZ drivers, gas fitters, uh, PSWs has been very popular. So those are wonderful opportunities. Um, having a positive culture. And that one's an intangible. A lot of employers really struggle with what that means. But really, um, that's about communicating with your employees, seeking feedback, understanding what they're looking for. I often um, hear from employers that they're blindsided when employees leave and they, they were surprised by some of the feedback they received. Keep talking to them or do blind surveys. And then afterwards, don't assume that you have all of the feedback. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to have those open dialogues. And again, people who feel heard are often uh, much more loyal to their employers. Um, encouraging growth. So once again, it goes back to the training and encourage people to develop in the jobs. And don't be afraid to give people more responsibility and developing a trust with your employees and giving them that, those opportunities. Because you'll find again that there's a lot more loyalty. And if they feel invested in your business, you're going to find they're going to stick around. Um, and 
really focus on keeping the people you have. So you know, we've been talking a lot about how do I find people? How do I bring them in? But we really also want to look at how do I keep those star players who I've hired? How do I keep them happy? So it really goes back to the list that I just gave, but also some other pointers like having a very clear job description. It's interesting how many employers I speak to who are ghosted after a week or two or even lose somebody and um, they're surprised. A lot of times it's because the expectations weren't clear. So an employee comes on board, they think they know what the job is, they think they know what the employer wants and the gaps are, it wasn't really clearly stated. Or the other thing I often hear from employers, and I'm an employer as well, I've out, you know, had to look at this as well as, as a manager myself. Um, you want to make sure that if you see uh, constantly when you hire for a job, the same problem keeps coming up with the same, you know, with staff in the same job, it's probably that your expectations aren't as clear as you think they are. So in your mind, you might think that this is making a lot of sense, but it may be that your employees don't really understand. If they're frustrated or they don't understand or they don't feel confident, you're at risk of losing them. Um, having a clear onboarding plan. We, by the way, we do coaching in all of these areas with employers. We do offer workshops on a regular basis and we will also do custom work with employers as well. So if any of these things are, um, are struggles for any of employers, we'll absolutely work with you. Um, and having a solid onboarding plan, we actually have um, uh, a lunch and learn series that we will do on onboarding to help employers with this and how, how to bring them on board, how to, uh, again, help them with job descriptions, how you provide clarity. Um, you also have different people coming on board with different personalities. You'll have the type who really likes innovation and likes to solve problems. You have other people that are rule followers and they really want to know what are the policies, what are the procedures, tell me exactly how to do it. If you're the kind of employer, and we see this a lot with entrepreneurs, who it thinks it's great to you know, give people lots of freedom to do their job, that's terrific. But you might have somebody who still needs to come on board and have those rules and procedures in place ahead of time so that they know where they stand and what you're expecting of them. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough, seek feedback, ask how people are doing, talk to them, be open to suggestions. Even if you can't solve all of the problems, be open to that conversation and consider where you might be able to offer some flexibility. Even that being that ear and being a good listener goes a very long way with employees. And then finally, um, back to finding people, virtual job and career fairs. So, so Luke's been doing a lot of this with his sites. We're the same. We've been doing this uh, with great success. It really does help employers as well to get the word out. Okay. So, Probably out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so keep the staff you have. That's, that's a really important point. Luke, what do you see as the solutions? Well, um, I want to echo and reiterate a lot of what Lisa said, um, because right now, um, while we're still in a pandemic um, and there's that disconnect, um, you know, we have a we have a hybrid working virtually and then working within the office safely with COVID protocols. And some people are working from home. Some people aren't. Um, I agree, uh, having regular check-ins with your employees, whether they're in office or out of office, and it's not just, you know, you have performance reviews and things like that. Um, these are more mental health check-ins with people, making sure they're okay. Is there anything that I can help you with? Anything that I can do? I know with my staff, we do uh, mental health uh, Zoom with a uh, yoga um, uh, lady out of Huntsville. Um, so we have that once in a while. Um, we have, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of, you know, even just even uh, getting together and having just a quick coffee chat and discussion, making sure everybody's checked in, everybody's good. That's really important. And right now, more so than ever. Um, I think um, it's important um, that we have um, an understanding that there is more demand on people's time in terms of family. Um, some parents have chosen to keep their kids at home and, and, and do online education, that sort of thing. So employers um, have a challenge of, um, you know, the, the pressures of uh, family, and those pressures outside of work uh, that are a time demand on people. 
Um, so having it, uh, an understanding of that um, and making sure that that is a, a consideration, having the flexibility, like Lisa said. Um, for our area, um, remote work is tricky. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'm quoting this correctly, but I think around 60, 65% of the jobs um, are, uh, the person has to be on site. Uh, and you look at manufacturing, you look at construction, big industries in our area, you can't do that remotely. Um, so that, that presents a bit of a challenge, but for the people that can work from home safely, having that flexibility to do that is important. Um, so employers, we've seen employers that allow employees to work once or twice a day from home and then the rest of the days they're in the office, that sort of thing. So again, going back to flexibility. Um, and we offer the same um, Canada Ontario job grant that Lisa was talking about. That's a great program up to $10,000 um, that the government uh, will provide uh, under 52 weeks of training. Um, so that's a great way for employers to upskill um, and uh, you know develop the workforce. Um, we also did an employer information session, which Lisa was a part of, um, and that was great. I think that's something that we need to continue with and we will continue with um, just for employers to have an understanding of what grants and funding is out there and available. Um, you can spend hours upon hours upon hours Googling it, but you spend an hour with us to save hours of looking. So that's really important. We've had tremendous feedback from that. Um, so we will continue to do that um, to help employers. Um, so that's, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I'm, I'm sure Lisa could too, but we have a, a time frame. So, um, but I think it is, it's very important. Keep the people that you have um, happy, engage with them, regular check-ins um and um just make sure everybody's doing okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a question for for the, for the two of you um when i think of employment services traditionally historically i think of of someone who works with people who are job seeking but you're talking a lot about the work that you do with employers has that changed are, are you working more with employers now than in the past you can go ahead, Lisa. You want to take that one first? <laughs> I, well, I think there's more of a, obviously, more of a demand from employers, um, whether it be hesitation um, because of the pandemic and, and um, whether people don't really want or hesitant to go back to work. And also the fact that um, uh, the working remotely is a bit of a challenge for a, a lot of employers in our area. Um, so I wouldn't say, but it, I go back to the check-ins. Um, you know, we're working a hybrid model of people coming in, maybe not so much, and relying a little bit more on digitally. I think um, if I, I think we need to be very uh, regular in our check-ins with both um, our employees, um, with our job seekers that we have as clients, but as well as with our employers. Um, where we we work the hybrid model of in person and um, uh, digital to ensure there's no disruption of services that we provide. Um, but I think now more than ever, those check ins with everybody across the board is is very important. Okay, um, so let's go to Wade. Wade Matthews, hello. How are you today? I'm well, thank you, Pamela, and thank you for having me today. Thanks for joining us. What are the solutions? Well, I'm gonna start somewhere different just because um, I won't be able to match um, the information that's been provided by our two other guests in terms of direct help for employers. Um, I'm gonna take the 10,000 feet view um, and just remind everybody, and because it's easy to, for us to forget um, that COVID-19 has really tested um, our conception of what makes good economic sense. It has tested and involved reflection about what our labour market is and certain trends that have been happening in our labour market over the last 20 to 25 years. 
it's the kind of crisis that um, will always um, impel uh, reflection on aspects of um, our economy and our labour market. Just as an example, we've seen a huge amount of government intervention in our economy in the last 18 months at all levels of government. Um, and we've seen some quite startling uh, trends or new trends in our labour market, including a demand for a new social contract from employees. So uh, employees are basically in a situation where they're saying that we are no longer prepared to accept certain kinds of jobs at certain kinds of salaries or wage rates. Um, and this has happened all throughout Ontario. So. Um, for example, I know restaurateurs in Toronto are now potentially having to pay 20 to 20 to $25 an hour for wait persons or bartenders or whatever the case may be. So we're seeing a really fundamental shift in both the relationship between government and the economy, and that's obviously having flow-on effects in terms of what's happening in our labour market. So, And we don't really know where those trends are going to go. Um, so, for example, I mean... The Canadian government at the moment has levels of debt that we would never have imagined uh, three years ago, and nobody's talking about this as being a problem. Um, whereas three years ago, the common sense was, well, governments shouldn't be in debt. So we're seeing this kind of transformation in our understanding of the relationship between government and the private sector. And just one indication of that, to bring it a little bit closer to our current situation here in Muskoka, is that the government, both at the federal level and the provincial level, are providing a huge amount of money to support employers um, and have done over the last 18 months. And as an example, um, I think both Luke and Lisa have talked about this, the government programs that are being offered, the extension of the second career program, the apprenticeship supports that are being offered by the provincial government to try and help employers employ more apprentices. Um, and there's been a, a flurry of um, training opportunities that have been offered to employers by the provincial government, often subsidised subsidized or, or in terms of uh, sort of funding in terms of in-demand occupations, particularly in the healthcare sector too. So there has never before been as many um, places for employers to go to help with recruitment and uh, retention. Um, so both from the provincial government and also from various non-profit uh, non non organisations. So for example, if I was an employer in Muskoka, my first point of call would be my employment service providers. So that's Employment North, that's Agilic, and that's uh, the Wyatt Huntsville. They have a range of um, uh, services that they provide for employers to help them recruit the skilled labour that they need. So that would be my first point of call because as Luke said, they will have all the information about those provincial government grants um, for trainings, uh, for second career program, um, the Canada Ontario job grant, for example. So that, that would be my first point of call. But my second point of call too would be the colleges. So Georgian College and even Canada College offer um, services for employers to help them recruit staff from the student bodies at both Georgian and Canada. So these are the kinds of innovative solutions that perhaps employers might not necessarily be aware of that they could look at in order to recruit. But certainly we're in a very, very much a transformed time. We're in a transition period. We don't know what work is going to look like at the end of the, the COVID pandemic. We don't know what expectations are going to be like. So certainly wait and see. But I know employers need to act now. And those are the kind of suggestions that I would make. Employment service providers and colleges to help them with recruitment. Okay, thank you, Wade. So um, I have a lot of questions, but do, do, does anyone in the in the audience, does anybody have uh, a question that they would like to ask? You could put it in the chat or you could raise your hand. Any... Okay, not seeing questions and do feel free to, to, to jump in um, on the chat or by raising your hand uh, if, if you do have questions. So um, here's, here's one that I have. We found that, that, that there are a number of things feeding into what is happening right now. And, and one of them is the um, fair wage, the fair living wage. Does anyone want to comment on that? 
Nintendo. I could comment on that. The Ontario Living Wage uh, Network has just recently updated the living wage for Muskoka, um, and it's gone up by two dollars and seventy cents since the last time they um, they calculated that living wage. Um, and I think it's now. I, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think it's eighteen dollars and seventy cents an hour is the current uh, living wage estimate for Muskoka. So um, that is a that is well and truly above the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, in which is currently 15, but is set to go up by a dollar, as everybody knows, um, in the new year. The provincial government recently announced that. So, but it still will be um, well, truly above the minimum wage. But we know that at least prior to COVID, 15% um, of all Ontarians were on a minimum wage. So um, that's a large number of people living on a minimum, minimum wage. Um, and that's far in excess of any other province in Canada. Um, in terms of the percentage of those who work on the minimum wage. Um, and that's something I think that is reflected in um, people's unwillingness to go back to the kinds of jobs that they were doing before COVID. Um, the fact that we have a labour shortage right now, um, it's probably more likely to be in those industries which um, have minimum wage as a standard wage. It's probably that's where the shortages are potentially coming from. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see um, what happens as a result of, of that. But certainly in terms of the living wage, it's certainly gone up quite substantially in Muskoka over the last three or four years and much, much higher percentage increase than other regions in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you know what the, the fair living wage is in Perry Sound? Um, I don't have a formal number for you, but it would essentially be the same as the number that Wade's coming up with because uh, our cost of living, which a lot of people are very surprised to hear, is just as high, if not higher in the North. So um, it's it's comparable. And I think we had talked about this um, on the last, it was actually in one of the early articles um, when I was interviewed and we talked about, it's really like realistically, when anyone we have coming in, they need to be making 18 to $19 an hour minimum to be able to get by. Because there are other factors. We don't have public transportation. So even getting into your car and now gas is super expensive. So getting into your car and driving to a job, that in itself is a huge cost. So that, and, and, and housing is going up and everything else we all know about, mm -hmm. it's comparable. So, and what about that? What about the housing piece? I mean, we're hearing, we heard from Natalie Bubella at Mac that she hires really well-paid people um, and they can't find a place to live, even really well-paid people. Um, and and that's a that's a difficulty with for her for hiring. Are are you seeing anything in, in terms of our our folks uh, offering maybe some some kind of moving budget? Are folks offering housing? Are you seeing anything like that? Me. <laughs> um, and anyone on the panel but so um i can say like again for it's a it's a gap it's a problem in, in perry sound absolutely um and i know that there are a lot of efforts right now to get more housing built mm -hmm. um there are a lot of challenges behind that uh that housing as you know is a whole other conversation it's a whole other town hall that you'd want to have um, but essentially uh, the challenges that we have are it's right now it's the cost of building um, it's zoning. So we're seeing more efforts to purchase existing buildings and convert them into apartments, condos. There's been a fair bit of movement with that. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's zoning issues, costs around that um, that are the biggest concerns. Um, again, um, there has to be the accessibility. So if you go outside of our main court area and you go at you know, if, there, if there's availability, for example, in a nearby township to Perry Sound, those individuals still have to be able to get into town to work. Mm -hmm. so, so there's there's a lot behind it. Um, it it's not for lack of effort. Um, and again, we do have, um, you know, a board here in Perry Sound that actually focuses on just this. Rent gear to uh, income housing is another challenge. Again, it's 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 being able to build sufficient number of units. Because we're nowhere near it, not in any of our communities. We, our no. waiting lists are long. And I wonder, you mentioned transportation. I wonder if that's something else that employers maybe need to offer to folks. Although I, from the employer's standpoint, I, I don't know how they afford 
particularly service industry. You look at restaurants, their profit margin is 4%. Um, how, do they, how do they pay staff more than they have, do things like provide housing and transportation and stay afloat? It's kind of, it's kind of tricky. I think, it's, I think it's charged more. I think that's part of it. I think maybe we have gotten used to paying not the true value of things. When, we, when we're buying our things, when we're going to a restaurant, we're not paying the actual value. Um, so that's, that's, that's another piece for sure. We um, are seeing employers um, who are absolutely are absorbing some of those costs and are trying to provide housing or transportation for employees. And they often are more successful with their staffing when they do that. Mm -hmm. um, you made a great point about the cost. We're also seeing a lot more innovation. This is something that's also come up with the pandemic, which is really cool to see. Um, pivoting. Um, mm -hmm. As much as I feel like that word, I've, I feel like that word is almost overused now, but pivoting has been big. And I can think of a couple of local uh, restaurant owners here who have been very good at that, um, offering more of like takeout options, that kind of thing, or some innovation with, you know, special packages. You know, we're seeing the charcuterie uh, thing taking off right now, you know, things like that. And as simple as that sounds, those are really smart pivoting moments where, again, they're finding ways to be able to bring in more so that they can sustain their staffing needs as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a comment uh, from a viewer that some businesses in Muskoka are offering carpooling uh, for their for their staff. Um, Wade, you looked like you wanted to say something. Do you do you have a comment on this topic? Well, I was just going to talk a, a little bit about housing because it seems to be the barrier to all. Um, our pro all problems in relation to economic and workforce development in Muskoka. If, we, if employers are looking for more staff, um, they can't just grab them out of the air. They need to they need to 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 be able to live somewhere and to be able to do it affordably. Um, and so, obviously, that is but that's a problem that faces every region on in Ontario right now. So it will be interesting to see what um, happens in that space. I know that there's. Um, a lot of things that have been announced in other in other regions in Ontario in relation to affordable and accessible housing, um, but it's certainly something that needs to be addressed, um, and it can't be left to employers to do this. It needs the intervention of government. Mm -hmm. Good point. And 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 how does government support business? You've said that they're supporting business in in unprecedented ways, um, but but maybe we're going to see other developments. Maybe we're going to see something like um, um, them uh, providing, helping businesses to provide a living wage, right? Possibly saving money in social services by having folks working and paying that bump up of two or $3 rather than the other. Um, okay, I have another question for you. Oh, Sarah Bisnett has a question first. Hi, Sarah. Hey. So I know we're talking about solutions here and maybe this is another concern or another worry or another bump in the path as we're going on it. But we've been hearing a lot about inflation and, and um, the talk about Pam started asking about um, not paying the real cost of things. And it reminded me of an interview I heard with a person in the restaurant industry or who wrote about the, yes, he was a, he was a food critic and he was writing about the restaurant industry. And he was saying that, food and restaurants should actually cost more than it is, but it was the workers in the back in the kitchen um, who are earning less of an income to keep the food at a more affordable rate. Um, and then, then, then that got me thinking about inflation and how also things are starting to cost more because inflation. Um, so how, how does that impact businesses when they're trying to keep afloat and keep their bottom, uh, keep their, their, their costs down? Um, but will they have all these pressures to pay living wages and and catch up to maybe where we should have been 20 years ago in the face of inflation today? That was convoluted, sorry. <laughs> that, that seems like a broader vision kind of question, Wade. An economic question. Well, I mean, that's uh, uh, the Sarah is right. Obviously, inflation in September, I think, was 4.4%. Which is the highest on record, I think, in this century. Um, traditionally, since the early 80s, we haven't actually dealt with inflation. Inflation generally comes about because of wage pressure. 
Um, and I know throughout the Western world in the 1970s, it was because of uh, the pressure on uh, pressure of unions to uh, push wages up. So that was the last time we faced an inflation crisis. I'm not sure this is the same kind of inflation crisis. I think this has to do with supply chains uh, primarily. Um, and I think it also has to do with the cost of gas. So 3.5% of that 4.4% increase was from gas prices, which basically follow on to every other uh, good in our commodity in our society. So I would be I would be hesitant to say that we are in an inflation crisis, um, just simply because supply chains will eventually come through, the bottlenecks will open up um, and we may go down, but you know, let's wait and see. But certainly inflation is a problem, not just for employers, it's a problem for everybody, particularly those people who live on low incomes, because obviously the cost of living goes up by 5%, which can be quite substantial for somebody who's living on, say, $2,000 a month, which was what CERB was uh, prior to it being uh, being taken away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, speaking about the great resignation, uh, we have people looking at their lives saying, I want something different. And uh, many, many, many people developing the side hustle. Um, so, providing goods and services to people on a really small scale level that allows them maybe to offer it uh, less expensively um, and, and bring value to themselves. We're seeing tons of creativity. We're seeing lots of things being offered. So for the people in Perry Sound Muskoka who are, who are launching a side hustle, is there support for them? Where would they go for help? I uh, think the first port of, oh sorry Lisa sorry, go I was going to say that I was going to say the chambers both the Bracebridge uh, Muskoka Lakes and uh, Huntsville Chambers of Commerce would be my first point of call if I was in Muskoka uh, for advice and for help um, in terms of uh, starting um, a small business uh, right now uh, and they would have a lot of programs that they could offer and a lot of advice that they could offer um, people in that situation but the point that you're making about the rise of side hustles is spot on um, there's a huge number of new side hustles or small businesses that are emerging and have emerged out of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it brings complexity, it brings variety, it brings creativity, gives people great uh, sense of accomplishment and sense of, of independence, right? I'm not working for somebody, I'm working for myself. Um, Lisa, you were going to say something. Small business enterprise centers as well. So this is a provincially funded program, and um, I can speak for the one that's in Perry Sound, and uh, and actually that would be in your catchment too, Luke. That's the business center, mm -hmm. um, and they provide amazing services. So they help with writing business plans. If I was starting a business, that's where I'd be going. They help with uh, writing a business plan, helping to you know flesh out ideas. They have workshops on developing business plans. Um, thinking through all of the elements that need to come together. Um, they also have a great program that I'm familiar with, which is called Starter Company. And um, again, not to speak for their program entirely here, but um, you can actually apply potentially for some grant funding towards your startup business or for growing your business. So there's some great opportunity there. Um, and you can, and, and absolutely, there are many people that start that with a side hustle. Okay, Luke? I think Sorry, I was just going to reiterate uh, what Wade had said. Um, reach out to your Employment Ontario service providers. Even if it's information like that, we, we refer you out to our great community partners like the Business Centre. Um, we're able to help you. So I think it's just anybody who's thinking employment, employers thinking employment, job seekers thinking employment, reach out to your Employment Ontario service provider. That's what we do. We're here to help. Okay, thank you, Luke. So we're 11 minutes out. It, here's an opportunity to wind up and I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. Wade, would you like to begin with the wind up? So yeah, my, my basic point in terms of a wind up was, would be that we're in a transition period where it's not clear where exactly we are going, um, but the trend does seem to be um, toward transformation in our labor market and transformation in the relationship between uh, the government and the economy. Um, and so we can expect to see more government intervention in the economy in the coming years. 
Um, and I would, if I was an employer right now in Muskoka to take a smaller scale, I would just reiterate what Luke said, reach out to your employment services provider. They will have the information that you need to recruit and also to retain staff. Um, and if you're starting a small business, because um, we have seen reports, um, as you suggested, that there's a large number of people now who are moving into self-employment, reach out to your chambers, but also reach out to your small town business associations and also reach out to employment service providers because there are people there that can help employers um, get to where they want to be. Thank you. Okay, Luke, how, what, what, what's the final word from Luke? Oh, I have lots of final words. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, um, I will reiterate what I had just said and um, when, what we, we've all um, sort of been discussing. Um, I think people, uh, employers are being flexible and um, being understanding of, um, of the time demands that are on people nowadays. It's just, it's more so than ever. Um, there's more of a demand on um, your time being at home with your kids, if you're, you know, schooling them at home. So it's hard to, um, you know, to work. So having flexible options, I think is very important. Um, and for the employers, um, there's lots of programs that we offer that can help. Um, there's so many, um, certain ones have, different eligibility criteria. So it's really important to reach out to your service provider and have that discussion and see if it's the right fit. Um, and with um, the Canada Ontario job grant with second career, um, these are all great programs that um, can help. And it's, it's money that's available there. Um, even the wage subsidy program to help offset initial training costs because let's face it, the, the largest um, expense item is payroll and uh, paying your employees. So having some money to help offset that, those initial training costs um, is, is key and it's important. So um, reach out to your Employment Ontario service provider um, whenever you have any employment, any uh, concerns, um, and we're more than happy to help or will send you to the right person and refer you to the right person to help so so would that training job grant would that uh help folks with with onboarding like is that like would that count what kind of training does it does it support it at canada ontario job grant um is for upskilling and for workforce development um, so we've seen a lot of AZDZ um, applications. Um, so and and it and it's for existing staff um, or for staff that um, that that they're looking to hire new hires. Um, and I think it's a great uh, opportunity um, because it's the government covers up to five six of the cost up to ten thousand uh, dollars and the training has to be under a year um, but training is expensive and you don't know if the employee is going to stay or if they're going to go right so um, i think training and investing money into keeping uh your employees um we we're we're uh humans we we like we want to learn and we want to continuously evolve and professionally you know professional development is huge so I think investing in training your employees investing in new technology um, I did talk about our virtual reality career exploration um, that's um, you know just to have people understand um, potential trade that they might get into which could lead to an apprenticeship um, that's all very important. Um, another thing I want to mention really quickly is our ministry um, has developed a partnership with LinkedIn and we offer, I believe it's 16,000 or so, Lisa, um, mm -hmm. courses um, that job seekers and employers can access. And that's all free um, mm -hmm. up until the end of March. Um, so 
we're trying to push that out and let people know. I think training is huge and, you know, it's a great thing to do from the comfort of your own home. So I think it's um, investing in employees um, and, and training opportunities. That's, that's something that I, I can't stress enough. It's uh, something that'll keep people happy and that'll encourage others to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to stay. So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. The final word today goes to Lisa Cook. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna just say, Wade, Luke, spot on on everything. Thank you so much. And Luke, how did I forget LinkedIn Learning? Cause that's a huge one and employers, can really benefit from it as well. There's lots of great stuff on there on managing teams, managing people, there's certif certificate programs. And again, it's all free of charge. Luke can give access, I can give access. So please reach out to us for that. Thank you, Luke, for bringing that one up. I can't believe I, I didn't think of that one before. Um, I, I'm gonna just leave this with very briefly. I think it's just important and we all have to accept that this is a world where we have to see our, our staff as customers. They are our internal customers. So we have to treat them as such. It's very important that um, we recognize that our relationship with our employees is not transactional. It's a long-term relationship mm. and we do have to invest in them, whatever that looks like. So whether it's training or, you know, we talked about onboarding, whatever it is, these are relationships that are the most critical piece of our business. If we don't have people, we don't have a business. So we have to absolutely step into this. I know sometimes it's a very difficult concept for a lot of employers right now. They get frustrated because it's, I'm paying wages. What's the problem? But we have to take a step back and look at that. I can't emphasize enough. If I'm going to leave one piece here, it's feedback. Encouraging feedback with employees and being open to what they have to say and keeping that dialogue going. Questions like, how are you doing? What's going on? What's, your, what's going on for you right now? What can I do to help? These are huge and they will go a very long way. If you have a larger staff, you can do a free um, survey monkey, send it out, have them do it anonymously, come back, see what you get, but don't leave it at that. Then you want to follow up and talk to people, engage. And that's a trust thing. So people have to feel comfortable that they're, that they're not in any threat by talking to you about it. That's how I'm going to leave it, I think, because I think that's the most important thing. And that's how you're going to develop those assets over time. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Luke. And thank you, Wade, for joining us again. So much information in these panel discussions. Um, and we will probably three months from now, it will be time to, to come back and look at what the situation is, is then because it develops. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, we are taking a hiatus from um, Thursdays at noon, our live community events for the month of December, because it's the month of December and there's just so much going on, but we will return in the new year. Please do look for our lineup. Thank you and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.